flower is the elixir of life, literally the golden pill. All changes of spiritual consciousness depend upon the heart. Here is a secret charm. Hi everybody. Welcome to the secret of the golden flower. Uh, this will be the last episode of this series of first chapter anyway. And whether or not we stick with this subject or we go on to something else in another series uh, is up to you. You got to let me know in the comments. If you want more of the secret of the golden flower, because there's lots more. <clears throat> or do you want to go on to a different subject? I was thinking of uh, bhakti actually. So um, I, I don't see it as any different, <laughs> but that's a story for another series. Is that what you want to hear, or do you want to hear the same, more of the same, or qigong, or what? Let me know. Okay, so we're going to talk more about Jain logic. And that's because without it, it's going to be very hard to understand what is going on. Uh, same one with Paticca Samupada. I gave last time some links to other series, and I took a day off or so, and I didn't post anything. So hopefully you had time to view those other videos. I'll put a link up again, if you haven't. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to follow what I'm talking about here. So, Jane Logic has seven truth values. We went over that last time. And without Jain logic, it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to understand this teaching. Because first of all, in front of every logic condition, logic level, or truth value, there is the word siad, which means in some ways. You see, from its very root, this is a multi- uh, truth, multi-ordinal or multi-dimensional system. So in some ways it is, but in some other ways it might be something else. Well, what else could it be? In some ways it is not. In some ways it is and it is not. See, in some ways, for example, thoughts. Okay. Thoughts are, in some ways, you can experience them, you can generate them, you can even control them to a certain degree. Although the more you control them, the more neurotic and fucked up you get. <laughs> Just a warning, folks. But you can also see them as ephemera, as simply semantic symbols for a reality that we have lost track of. And now we're reasoning with the symbols instead of the reality. So usually what happens when we come back to the reality, things are different than we expect. Oops. <laughs> What's that called? Conceptual dissonance. So in some ways, it is, and it is inconceivable. Now this word inconceivable is avyaktavyaha. Avyaktavyaha literally means can't be spoken. It's unspeakable, <laughs> words, beyond words. And that's certainly true of uh, anything that's transcendent. So it might even be placeholder for transcendent. It is and it's transcendent. It's inconceivable. I've several times in this series <laughs> brought up the idea of awareness of awareness of making an exercise of being aware of your awareness, and where it is and how it is. 
and then being aware of watching your awareness and so on. So this is a whole thing that you can get into as an exercise. But you can't ever describe it to anybody else or even to yourself. It's a completely real-time experience. Can't be abstracted. Except maybe to say how to do it. Which is only be aware of your awareness. <laughs> Did you ever put two mirrors face to face together like this? And then stand in between them? What do you see? Huh? Well, the, the best, of course, is if you make a whole tiny hole in one of them and look through that. And what you see, of course, is an infinite regress of mirrors reflecting mirrors on and on and on into a singularity, which is the resolution of your viewing apparatus modulo the graininess of the emulsion in the mirror. So anyway, physics aside, what you're seeing in the mind when you are aware of awareness is like that. It's like an amplifier. Or really or more, more like, like an echo. Echo, echo, echo. Echo, repeat. Echo, repeat. Maybe, Maybe I'll put I'll some in this segment, segment so you'll hear so what it sounds like. like. Hey, 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 hey. Anyway, in some ways, it is or it is not, or it is and is not. And it's inconceivable. Well, we can just cut to the chase. <laughs> it's, it's inconceivable. And this opens the door to direct experience of enlightenment. Just by turning the light around. See? Otherwise, it's back there in that part of the reality, those viewpoints that you can't see. Siat, in some ways. So you could, as soon as you become, as soon as you be, as soon as you take a location in space-time, as soon as you adopt a method of viewing, whether it's with the mind or any of the other senses, you create <laughs> a, a vector where you can see. It. Just like if you're on the south side of a mountain, you're going to see the sun come up and go across and go down. But if you're on the north side of the mountain, at least part of the day, you're going to be in shadow. You have to be. Physics can. So it's, yeah, you can look at it like just like physics, yeah. As soon as you put an instrument into being uh, to direct your awareness through it, your viewpoint is limited. Whether that instrument is a sense or a mind or a thought or a concept or whatever it is, whatever kind of abstraction it is, okay, it's going to be limited. Because what is an abstraction? You say, this is different from that. That's the fundamental abstraction. And the, the fundamental abstraction here is between is and is not. But that is transcended by the unknowable the inconceivable, the indescribable, the transcendent. See, without this kind of logic, you cannot process the secret of the golden flower. It, it won't go through. It'll get stuck. Your mind will start finding so-called contradictions in it. But you see, the this secret of the golden flower has no problem switching between emptiness and the male and female as different parts of the psyche coming together in a divine marriage, which wakes you up to the whole cosmos. That's the, the, the orgasm of realization. First path. I'm telling you, it's, it's dramatic. It's really impressive. I'm not going to say more about it here because I already wrote about it extensively in my book, The uh, Dormasar Solution. So, 
in some ways, I could say that I'm enlightened. In some ways, I could say that I'm not enlightened. In some ways, I could say I both am and am not enlightened. For example, Buddha nature is in everyone. But until you realize it fully, it's like you don't recognize it or you don't get it. So maybe I'm just making up a story about being enlightened. But if that encourages someone to become enlightened, actually, isn't that okay? Well, it is and it isn't. <laughs> and it's inexplicable. Because at this point, you don't know if I'm putting you on or not, if this is for real, or if I'm just creating it as a device to get somebody to, to try it who is more skilled than I am and who can actually attain it. And I'm not going to tell which one it is. <laughs> maybe it is and maybe it isn't. <sighs> bullshit. It's all bullshit. You know, this is why I go back and forth about doing these series. <laughs> because I know ultimately it's all bullshit. And until you transcend even the holy path and the holy teacher and the holy lineage and the whole pile of shit, <laughs> you're not going to get the fertilizer <laughs> to put on your garden <laughs> and make the flowers bloom. See, you have to be ready to accept all of it. Not just the parts you like. Not just the parts that you even, that you can see. But all of it. Even the impossible parts of it. Because our idea of what is possible and impossible is a fabrication. It's a line drawn in the sand. It's arbitrary. It's based on our past. It has nothing to do with what's actually possible. I talked about this at length in my series, Apophatic, oh dang it, Apophatic Antifragility. <laughs> I can't even, I never could pronounce that very well. Why am I playing with words when I know perfectly well that words can't express what I'm talking about? See? In that series, I explain all that in detail. So, <laughs> you know, if you want to doubt me because of being cynical about words, that's okay. But watch that series first, because I know what I'm doing. <laughs> words are, this is all a joke, right? I mean, like Rajni says, I'm absolutely non-serious. And then he acts very serious and even tells jokes completely dead pants. I've seen one, one or two discourses, so we've lost it. <laughs> he started laughing at his own jokes. But anyway, <laughs> they must have had some good soup that night, Krishna. Mm, but anyway, um, mm, what we're trying to do here is just create a vehicle that like a framework that gets you to do a certain practice. That's all. And I suppose if I could diagram it all out and make a pretty geometric figure and blah, blah, blah. Would that help? I can do that. But for me, the most valuable thing that I learned from many of my teachers was that whatever you come across that sounds good, even if it's like a moonshot, try it, do it, see what happens. Huh? You don't know what's going to happen. It's not called the unknowable for nothing, you know what I mean? Here is a secret charm, which, although it works very accurately, is yet so fluent that it needs extreme intelligence and clarity and complete absorption and calm. But what has to come next are 
the jhanas. Buddha's eight levels of mind absorption. Samadhi, dhyana, jhana. It's the same word, just in Pali. So without practice of the eight jhanas, you don't have the experiential base. You know, we talk a lot about ontology in our various series. And ontology is like a conceptual base or even a verbal symbolic base for measuring experiences. But now we're turning the whole thing around. And we're saying experience really you know, ultimately is the only measuring stick, reliable measuring stick. But that experience has to be based on something, some standard. Huh? Like if we want to measure electricity, it's volts, ohms, amps. If we want to measure distance, it's miles or kilometers, whatever. Okay, So that we, we can communicate about it. Otherwise, it's like, you know, I mean, it's impossible anyway, but at least it's less impossible <laughs> if we have a common language. So... People without this highest degree of intelligence and understanding, understanding comes from meaning, and meaning comes from context. And context, in part, is built on a lexicon, an ontological relationship. Remember the triples? Huh? A three-way relationship between a thing, a symbol, and a definition. So people without this highest degree of intelligence and understanding, ontological understanding, do not find the way to apply the charm. Why? Because if you do not understand the terminology used to describe the process, you can't do the process. You won't be able to apply it. And this is what I've been pounding and screaming since the Matrix Learning Series. So, people without this utmost capacity for concentration and calm cannot keep fast hold of it. <laughs> this is a joke. This is a little in joke. Because what people think when you tell them, you know, you're going to do this process, right? Oh, is that they start to cling to it. And they really, you know, can get attached to it. This is in Thailand, the monks have an expression sitting on a hundred-foot pole. You ever see a flagpole sitter? This guy has got this little platform, maybe a meter square at the most, and he's sitting on top of this high flagpole, maybe a hundred feet high. Now, of course, you don't want to go anywhere, right? <laughs> You'll be in trouble. <laughs> or if you fall asleep, you know, my God, it's over. So, on the one hand, they're afraid to go forward, and they're also afraid to go back. Oh, it's a terrible thing. Because they're attached. Around the third jhana, you start to get so much bliss, you know. And I told you in this series exactly how to do it. Right? So you got to watch the whole series and learn all these techniques. Try them. Try them. You might be surprised. They might actually work. But the reason you don't try them is not because you don't understand them, because I've made it as simple as possible, but because you're afraid. You're afraid you'll see something in yourself. So, people without this utmost capacity for concentration and calm, jhanas, cannot keep fast hold of it. This is the joke. Because if you try, the more you try to hold on to it, the more it's going to slip away. But, exhausting yourself with the effort leads to a collapse into let go. When you finally had it, when it, you can't hold on anymore, it's like, ah, I can't do this anymore. I can't take it anymore, right? Then you suddenly relax. Boom. That's when it happened. That's when it happened to me at the end of like, I don't know, 50 or 60 days in Oregon. And sitting 12 to 18 hours a day, one day I suddenly relaxed. It was like, hey, I can afford a little downtime here, you know. I already did eight hours today since 4 a.m., so let me have a little soup and jerk off for a while. 